The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. I'm Maura Aaron's Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever, the show that looks at the intersection of mental health and work, and how we can all do both better. We're going to talk today about getting what we need, mostly in the context of work, but that starts with a baseline of understanding what our brains need to thrive and then figuring out how to communicate and translate that into our career and relationships at work. For those who go undiagnosed with autism into adulthood, the work world can be particularly challenging. It can be rigid, not very understanding. And if you're a neurodivergent or you struggle with your mental health, it can be easy to feel like you're broken or you're a project that needs to be fixed. That's not true. When you understand how you function best, you can ask for what you need, and you can develop strategies and tactics for creating a work life that supports your gifts while building in support and infrastructure for the challenges that come with having a tricky brain that functions differently. Today's guest is someone who was diagnosed with autism at the age of 38, well into her career, And that revelation helped this writer, podcaster, and business coach rethink her relationship with work and what she needed from her daily schedule and the other structures we have in our days. And here's the thing. Everyone benefits when we work more flexibly and we're more adaptive. So let's learn from an expert. Tara McMullen is host of the show, What Works, and she joined me to speak about her diagnosis and how it changed her day-to-day existence. To understand that journey, I started by asking Tara what her daily work used to look like. From the age of like 27 to 38, I was doing various online business activities, things like website design, course creation, lots of business coaching. And then in the last few years there, my real focus was on building a community, sort of a social network of small business owners and helping them help each other, really focused on the connecting piece and and kind of shaping how people could share information and share experiences and observations in a way that was helpful to each other, as well as kind of guiding that and leading that kind of conversation myself. And there was a lot to that that was working. You know, I really enjoy being useful and helpful and, you know, having something of value to give. I mean, I think that's probably pretty universal, but I had <laughs> I had created this situation for myself in which I really felt like I could show up every single day and be useful to someone somehow, and often to a lot of people all at once. I was doing a lot of teaching in addition to coaching, and that's a happy place for me. There's sort of like the performance aspect of it, but there's also the usefulness piece, the the value piece there as well. And it was a really nice combination for me. I felt very comfortable with that. But over that time, I also was constantly putting myself in the position of having to be social all the time, (laughs) right? You know, coaching. I had a conversation with a friend recently about coaching and we were joking about how, you know, coaching, I would imagine Mm -hmm. it's super, it's super emotionally intensive. It is very, very introvert draining, I would imagine. And also the sense that like you're caring for your clients in a way that feels very personal. Like they are giving you a lot and you are helping them with big stuff. That's to me, that would be very difficult to manage my boundaries around. Yes. I, yeah, that, that's it in a nutshell. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I think, you know, before I was 
you know, in the sort of in the middle years when sort of outwardly I was the most successful and inwardly I was starting to burn out, you know, just really tire myself out. I didn't recognize how emotionally intensive the work I was doing was. I just sort of showed up and did it because I am someone who has always been really good at putting on hats and taking off hats, right? Mm. You know, I I used to work retail management. That was my first full-time job out of college. And, you know, I had this very distinct feeling that walking through the double doors at the front of the Borders Books and Music that I was working at, <laughs> you know, I was putting on a hat. I was becoming someone new. It was I was playing a character that was the sales manager of Borders Books and Music. And I was doing very much the same thing as a coach, as a community builder, as an educator. I would put that hat on. But what I didn't realize, which was true of retail management, too, <laughs> was uh <-huh. laughs> the emotional labor, the effective labor, the material labor that was going into that act of putting the hat on. And because mm -hmm. I didn't know that it was there, I couldn't care for myself outside of that role in a way that would replenish it or even recognize that it didn't matter how much time I took away from that kind of work. I wasn't going to be able to replenish my reserves because the emotional strain was so great. Caring for yourself in the role. Why did you become a coach? Like, I mean, because that's kind of a bold leap to go from being a manager at Borders Books and Music to being a business coach. Yeah. Um, I <laughs> fell into it. <laughs> wow. There was, there was nothing planned. I didn't know that that's the, the path that I had inadvertently put myself on. But one of the interesting things about managing a Borders at the time was that each individual store sort of ran itself like its own little small business with mm -hmm. the support of corporate. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't realize it then, but I realized it shortly after that really what was happening there was I was starting to fall in love with questions about how to run a business, how to manage a team, how to market things, how to sell things. Like those questions were really, really interesting to me. And so the sort of story arc there is that I got married, I got pregnant, I got denied a promotion that I should have gotten when I was nine months pregnant. And so I just didn't go back. And I told myself, you know, other people have figured out how to work from home and do their own thing. If they can do it, certainly I can as well. And so from there, I kind of found the world of blogging and found the world of, you know, just people kind of making things up as they go livelihood wise online. And the more I got into it, the more people came to me and said, hey, can you help me with this? Or what would you do in this situation? Or, you know, bringing me the business questions. And I didn't necessarily know the answer but I knew how to ask other questions and I knew how to research and I knew how to, you know, put the pieces together. And so in that process, sort of fell into coaching, fell into consulting to a sort of like dual strategy wise. But yeah, it was it was totally a fluke. And you fell into work that ultimately, though, didn't care for yourself. Yeah, but you were obviously good at it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, I'm sure there are a lot of people who wish I was still doing it now, <laughs> but I can't, I, you know, I just, I, I can't, and I'm sure we'll get into some of the reasons why, but it was a good way for me to realize I had some skills and some ability that translated into this particular environment, but it was also a really good way for me to you know, I look back on it now and I almost see that time as like intensive, almost ethnographic research. Like I was in there <laughs> listening to people talk about their problems, listening to people talk about how they were experiencing the culture of social media and the culture of the online world and how they were interacting with it. And so now I can see like, oh, okay, 
maybe I can, you know, sort of recast that story as one of intense research. And now that period is kind of over for me, but I've taken all of that research and I've taken all of the understanding of that and I've shifted it into a new area of research or a new type of research that I'm doing now and, and the product of that. So yeah, it was it was work that I was good at and I think that it was work that was serving me in a way that I didn't understand at the time. So you wrote a blog post with the title, (laughs) the URL title, I'm going to read it, emotional labor dash entrepreneurship dash and my breakdown. Yeah. So let's go there. (laughs) Yeah. Let's just orient you in time. So when did you start your business? I started my business in 2009. So I would have been 27. And 2020, I was 37, 38, depending on what time of the year. And so, you know, I was very well established. I was running a community of close to a thousand small business owners. I was also hosting sort of business coaching mastermind or peer mastermind kind of support group situation, doing a lot of facilitation. Hmm. And at the beginning of, you know, January, February of 2020, I was riding high. I was like, this is finally working. It feels sustainable. This is awesome. And then (laughs) the world (laughs) fell apart. (laughs) Suddenly what had felt comfortable and if not like, you know, it was exhausting, but it still felt manageable in a lot of ways. And I think, you know, part of that was denial, but still it felt manageable at that point. And then when things started to fall apart, what had become for me a really predictable experience, like I'd been coaching long enough, I'd been facilitating and teaching long enough that I felt like I knew I had a really good sense of what I was showing up to every time I showed up to a mastermind session or a Q&A call or whatever the event was that I was hosting. But 2020 threw all of that into question. And, and it was a complete guessing game every time I showed up live with people. Mm. Sometimes people were super optimistic and they were excited about something that they had learned because of the pandemic or something that they had learned because of Black Lives Matter. And then other times people showed up completely deflated, Mm. frustrated, angry, sad, you know, right. Like just the whole gamut of human emotion. (laughs) And, you know, in our community, there was this really interesting well, interesting in hindsight thing going on, which was that, you know, some of our folks were more successful than they'd ever been because they just happened to have been in the right business to be of service, yeah, yeah. you know, especially as, as a lot of companies were going to online or, you know, remote work instead of in the office. A lot of our people could support that and help that. And they were doing amazing. And then there were other people in our community who lost everything, essentially. Mm. And so it constantly like juggling these extremes and they weren't consistent at all. Like it was just all over the place. And what had been that very predictable environment became inherently unpredictable and volatile. That was where for me, it started to just completely break down. So I didn't know it at the time, but knowing now that I am autistic, one of the things that is a must-have for me in terms of my mental well-being is predictability, routine, you know, knowing what to expect. And so the idea that I was hopping on the phone four times a week, five times a week with people that were themselves totally unpredictable, totally volatile, totally like you know, everyone was lovely and and meant the best. Like these were really great people, but they were going through stuff. Yeah. And I was supposed to be the rock (laughs) and I couldn't be the rock so long as things were volatile and uncertain. And by the end of that year, 
it had just gotten to be too much. And, you know, I had a bunch of people tell me that were in these small groups that I was leading. They were like, you know, I know that was so hard for you, but you did awesome. And I'm like, well, thank you. But I need to go like be in a hole now (laughs) for a long time. You know, basically from the end of 2020 into 2021, I had all of this work that I'd been doing for years and years, the masterminds, the coaching, the Q&As, and I had to get rid of as much of it as humanly possible or else bad things were going to happen. And by the middle of 2021, I was, you know, dealing with suicidal ideation and dealing with just not knowing how I was going to move on. So that's the breakdown piece. (laughs) We covered the emotional labor. You got depressed. I got depressed. Yeah, I was depressed. I was burnt out. I mean, kind of the classic clinical definition of burnt out is is exactly what I was going through. So it was the complete emotional exhaustion. One of the other things that I was experiencing was just sort of... um disassociation and self-alienation. So like I have a very distinct memories of August of 2021, you know, being in tears one moment and then showing up to a Zoom call and saying, hey, hi, how are you doing? Right. With that big smile on my face. And I'd look into the Zoom window and I felt like a different person. Like I felt like the person looking back at me was not me. And That was a really profoundly weird, uncanny experience. And it sort of underlined to me just how bad things had gotten. So as that year then progressed, I needed to say, I can't do this anymore. And so I had to leave the community that I had been building for years, for over a decade in one form or another, and say, this isn't this isn't the work for me anymore. I believe in this work. I believe in the values that underline this work intensely, but I'm not the person who can kind of lead that work and and that vision. Why do you think you got depressed in addition to being burnt out? Have you been depressed before in your life? I mean, suicidal ideation is a very intense place to be. Yeah. Yes. I have dealt with depression since I was at least 12. And I tend to go in, you know, kind of cycles of three to five years. So I was really depressed, you know, in junior high, again, in high school, again, right after college. At the end of college, I was so I, I went through this period of shutting down and, you know, depression and burnout that I was accepted to, given a full tuition to attend, you know, my top school, top choice graduate program. It had been something that I'd wanted to do for a long, you know, long, long time. And I had to withdraw before it even started, because I think had I made that move, I don't know that I would have survived it. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life, a promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. When did you learn you were autistic? So I learned sort of officially, as officially as like is possible for a middle-aged woman when I was 38, which I guess is not exactly middle-aged, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. But it was something that I had suspected since I was 15 or 16. I don't remember exactly when, but I know that I had saw like a 60 Minutes segment or something on boys with Asperger's syndrome sometime in the mid 90s. And I was watching it and thinking, wow, this is like super familiar. But by the time the segment ended, 
there was some sort of diagnostic criteria that I didn't meet. I was not a boy. (laughs) I was (laughs) I sort of didn't have the mm, I'm socially awkward and I have a lot of social anxiety, but I didn't have like social dysfunction, I guess, in the same kind of way as they were portraying. And I also was not obsessed with math at that time. Which oh, my is God. A kind of mathy, autistic stereotype. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And what's funny is I was actually obsessed with math as a younger child, just not by that time in my life. But anyhow, you know, so I, I'm seeing this and I'm like, oh, OK, this isn't me because people like me aren't diagnosed with this. This isn't something that people like me, specifically girls, get or have. So I kind of put that out of my mind. But, you know, as we were talking about, I struggled with my mental health throughout my teenage years, throughout my 20s. I think it was earlier in my 30s when I first started seeing some women my age identifying as autistic on social media. Mm-hmm. And thinking, oh, well, that's strange. Like, what what is that about? And for once, kind of seeing myself in these women who were identifying this way. But it wasn't until that last complete breakdown in 2021 when I was like, I need to figure this out because I am processing these things and dealing with these things in very, very different ways than everyone else around me. You know, and and it was just, it was very clear to me how different my experience was at that point. So I started Googling, like, am I autistic? (laughs) Or like autistic diagnosis (laughs) or autistic questionnaires or women in autism. And I started taking like literally all of the questionnaires that you could take online and scoring pretty high, which surprised me. And at first, you know, kind of set that to the side. And then I started hearing podcast interviews with a couple of women who were autistic. So Catherine May being one who wrote a book called Wintering uh, that was a New York Times bestseller. But before that, she wrote a book called The Electricity of Every Living Thing, which is her sort of memoir of learning that she was autistic. And then Patricia Lockwood was the other woman who I realized was autistic or, or who identified herself that way. And every time I heard that kind of experience related. It was just so my experience. Like it was that finally that that flash of, you know, someone else experiences the world this way. And so at that point, then I started talking to my husband about it finally, which is so typically like an autistic thing to do. Like, let me process this all myself before I tell anybody what's going on, <laughs> um, including the person I am closest to in this world. And he told me flat out, like, well, I've, I've wondered about that for as long as I've known you. <laughs> like, well, you know, really? how did it feel to hear that? Bad. <laughs> it felt really bad. <laughs> Why? Why? Because... For as for as much as I didn't want it to be true that I was autistic, I also felt I was really good at passing yeah. as not autistic. Yeah. And so for him to say, oh, I, I've wondered about that meant I wasn't as good as I thought I was at covering mm. up how different I was. And mm. is, Catherine May actually talks about this in The Electricity of Every Living Thing, too, a very similar experience of like her trying to process this all by herself before finally telling her husband. And she says, like, my biggest fear was that he was going to say, well, of course I knew that. <laughs> of course, this is who you are. And yeah, so yeah, it it felt really bad. But it also meant then that we could really quickly get on the same page and in terms of of processing it. So luckily, it was a very ephemeral feeling (laughs) of feeling bad. Mm -hmm. But the immediate reaction to it was was pretty negative. It sounds like gender. And and I know this to be true. Gender is a big piece here Mm -hmm. in our assumptions about what neurodivergence looks like, according to gender. Yeah, I did an episode last 
two years, I don't know when, about about autism at work. And it was mathy white guys. And I got a lot of feedback online, like, dude, (laughs) (laughs) you are just telling the stereotype. Like, we're not all data analysts, which I really, I really took to heart. Yeah. Yeah. I I think the statistic is that for every one girl diagnosed as autistic, three boys are diagnosed. Mm -hmm. But that's starting to change. And autism researchers tend to think now that it's there's pretty much parity gender wise. Hmm. The issue, of course, is that girls are socialized in a different way than boys are. So boys behavior in terms of like not responding to someone else's emotional needs or trying to fit into a social situation in a particular way that's not seen as so unusual or it's not corrected nearly as often but for girls and women of course that's a that's a huge part of our upbringing is like here is how you should be presenting yourself in this mm-hmm. situation and i would say that i've always struggled with that too but <laughs> You know, I'm a I'm a keen observer of other people. I you know, I see all of the details, I process all of those details, I'm subject to that same socialization. And so yeah, if I, you know, largely for girls and women, the kind of profile of autism is different, but only in external presentation, like only in that sort of self-conscious. I'm showing up this way because I'm supposed to sort Mm. of way, not actually, you know, there's no sort of internal difference between a girl's experience of autism and a boy's experience of autism. That's really fascinating. And I think it's interesting that we opened the episode with, with you sort of framing it around, I was doing work that didn't allow me to care for myself and what I needed. But obviously, the work that you were doing was extremely caring for other people. I mean, you were basically creating holding vessels for other people, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is not what we think of when we think of autistic people. No, no, it's not. But kind of, again, that it's more normal, more common for women to kind of show up, autistic women to show up in that way. And, you know, I think... One of the things that people often tell me about the work that I do now, so like the writing and the podcasting that I do now, is that I am really good at getting sort of to the underlying structure and systems of things. And I I kind of dissect a superficial phenomenon and get onto under it to like, why is this happening? What is this all connected to? And I very much do the same thing with people. It is one of my autistic superpowers, if you will. Um, (laughs) I am really good because I have to be at making what is invisible visible to myself. And then my work is making what I make visible to myself visible to other people. And it is what makes me really good at facilitation and coaching and teaching. But in some environments, like facilitation and coaching and and sometimes teaching, although not not as much with teaching, that is not a good environment for me to be doing that work in. Whereas, you know, writing and podcasting and kind of doing the the research and the thinking and then sort of distilling that down into something that people can use, that is an environment in which that particular superpower and my capacity as a human being Mm -hmm. really line up. And so I can do this work that I'm really, really good at. And I'm not killing myself in the process. It's so interesting. You nailed it. And because because what I remember most from our interview that we did is we were talking about probably imposter syndrome or, you know, the sort of perception that a lot of these feelings are entirely controllable within the self um, anxiety at work. And you said, Mm -hmm. well, wait a minute, what about the systems? Like, hang on a minute, women, people of color, people who are other or marginalized work in systems that make them anxious. So why are you telling people to fix it themselves? And that's my paraphrasing of what you said. It wasn't that (laughs) direct, but it was pretty direct. 
And um, and it was funny because it was something that I had been sort of processing, you know, and trying to figure out. I honestly, it really triggered me because in my book, one of my big regrets, like whenever you write a book, right, it's two plus years in the making. And so by the <laughs> yeah. time the book is published, you read it and you're like, I've learned so much since then. I really wish I could go back and rewrite this part. And the one piece that I wish I could rewrite about my book is I would include more systemic stuff. I would mm. include more intersectionality. I would include more basically framing of why mental health at work is not just in our heads, especially if we're a woman, a person of color, different in any way than the dominant structure of white men. And so what you said really triggered me and it made me feel both defensive and guilty and anxious and also really got me to a place of like, you know what, Maura, just own this. Start talking about it. Start acknowledging where you might have shortcomings in this, also because you're a privileged white woman. And let's go there, you know? And so it was it was extremely transformative for me, that one question. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's funny because I think as I was reading through your book, my experience of it was, cool, there is a lot of systems analysis in here and there is a lot of oh, acknowledgement. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. And I would not have asked that question had I not seen the foundation for it in the work that you did put out into the world. And I was literally just like trying to take your temperature. Like I was really interested in how you think about it because I could see the foundation of it in in your work. So I want to talk a little bit about anxiety and then I want to get really practical. Yeah. I just want to ask you sort of what, what your relationship is with anxiety and how that reflects, how you think your autism has played a role in that too. Yeah. So my relationship with anxiety is a fairly recent one, not because I have not always been anxious, but because I didn't know to call it anxiety up until a few years ago. So my husband and I, his family lives in western Montana. And so we've driven back and forth from Pennsylvania to Montana a number of times now. And I can't tell you which time it was. But on one of those very long car trips, when you're trying to like probe the inner life of the person that you are driving with, because just, gosh, <laughs> we need something to talk about. I don't remember how it came up, but he said to me, and it was a, a very innocent and honest, earnest question. Have you always been anxious or is this new? Ooh. And I was like, anxious? I'm not anxious. What are you talking about? I don't have anxiety. And then like we kind of processed it and it was like, oh, yeah, no, I've been this way my whole life. <laughs> um, but what I realized was that because depression was the the sort of pointy thing that needed to get softened, especially in my my teenage years, no one ever addressed anxiety with me. No one even wow. mentioned the word. It was always about depression. Actually, before it was about depression, it was about PMS or PMDD. Like, oh, you just have PMDD. Like, no, mm -hmm. you're chronically depressed. But OK. Um, but <laughs> in all of that, in all of the care that I had received in one way or another for depression, I had never ever received care for anxiety. I had never even had the conversation with someone about it. So he asked wow. me this question for probably five years ago now, four years ago now, and sort of had this wake up of like, oh, yeah, I've been anxious my whole life. So now my relationship with anxiety is is one in which I find anxiety really predictable in that I know exactly what triggers my anxiety so that even when I'm having a bit of an anxiety attack or I'm feeling that sort of profound like tingliness of anxiety and like there's not an acute reason for it, 
Mm -hmm. sort of that that nebulous anxiety, I can still say, oh, you know, I've been ruminating on this thing or I've been thinking about that thing or that thing that happened last week. I need to deal with that now. And like that's where the anxiety is coming from. So for me, it feels really predictable. But at the same time, I think because I'm aware of it now, it also feels really overwhelming at times. And so, you know, it's something where... I'm at a point where my depression is pretty well taken care of or is addressed in the ways that it needs to be addressed. And so I'm pretty even keel with that. And it means that the anxiety is just way spikier (laughs) than it used to be. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's that's my relationship with anxiety now. Wow. Sounds like your husband has a relationship with your anxiety, too. Oh, very much so. Very much so. <laughs> He's learned a lot in these last few years, it too. It sounds like he sounds like a pretty perceptive guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he is training now to be a coach and he is the perfect person to be a coach. He has all the right disposition for it and very much an, an extrovert who loves just finding out what's up with people. And so it's <laughs> it's funny to watch him blossom into, into this thing that I was really good at, but also just had no capacity for and watch him just be like, yeah. And then I was talking to this person and, and I, you know, I asked them this question and everything changed. I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, man. I love that. I love that. Let's talk about how you get what you need at work. Mm hmm. I think a huge theme of this show is learning from people like yourself who have to work differently, but also know what their superpowers are and so can like press the gas on the superpowers and hopefully do less of what is bad for them. I'm curious how you thought about reframing your own work and how that might be instructive for someone listening who's like, yeah, wow, this work is not letting me care for myself. I got to shift. Yeah, I think a lot about my personal capacity in all of its different dimensions. So, you know, time, money, sure, mental energy, emotional bandwidth, social support, you know, all of those different dimensions that I kind of put under the the umbrella of capacity. I've had to get almost really quantitative about it. Um, There was a time when I was first trying to suss all of this out that I was sort of giving different activities, like literally points value. Also, very autistic thing to do. Um, (laughs) But I was I was literally giving things points value and kind of adding up the day and being like, yeah, that's too many points. So recognizing one that I have a particular capacity and that it is possible to exhaust it. And then two, recognizing what resources within that capacity I have more and less of. Just kind of taking my husband as a foil here, I have a really low capacity for or resourced amount of emotional bandwidth, right? There's just mm. only so much that live and in person or or kind of on the edge of social activity that I can do, whereas he has this like almost unlimited well of emotional bandwidth. And he would be happy talking about his feelings all of the time or talking about other people's feelings all of the time. I know he's he's a strange dude, but I love him. Um, <laughs> so being able to recognize that was huge for me. Yeah. And then being able to kind of assign it, whether it was an actual points value or just sort of knowing, OK, I can't do 12 calls a week anymore. It needs to be three max. And being able to kind of set that boundary for myself to have a response when I'm asked to do something that I might want to do, but that I don't have the capacity for. And just literally being able to say to someone, hey, I would love to be able to do this with you or for you or say yes to this but I don't have the capacity for that right now. Similarly, I've also learned to ask myself the question, instead of, can I squeeze this in? I ask myself, do I have what I need to do this well? Because I know that not being able to do things well, having to phone things in, having to literally squeeze it in, 
it's a source of lost confidence for me, right? Lost self-efficacy. If I'm constantly doing something that I don't have the resources for, I can't do it well. And I'm going to start to learn that, well, I don't do anything well. And so making sure that my time is devoted to actions that I can do well because of my given capacity, my given resources in any given area, that has been the thing that has sort of on the most practical level just transformed the way that I work. But that's also meant that I've had to completely rethink what it looks like to put together a livelihood, right? I don't well, that's have That's the question. Yeah. yeah. I mean, cuz cuz like I think I could imagine a lot of listeners and we we had Dan Mangana on the show who is also on the spectrum and he's like I work 10 hours a week. And I was like, "Good for you." But, you know, I can imagine a person listening and being like, "Like I have a job. Like I can't work to, <laughs> I I can't just do three So so that's the question and I come up against this all the time in which I feel very much like, you know what? I mean, I did four hour long media interviews and podcasts yesterday. And it was, I mean, I had nothing left at the end of the day with my kids, with my work. I got nothing. And and I was like, but Maura, you can't say no. This is this is becoming your livelihood. And so that's the question. Yeah. First, I will say that I do not have this figured out. <laughs> this is <laughs> okay. a, this is in process. <sighs> so I don't only work 10 hours a week. I probably work 50 hours a week yeah. at this point, but I'm working 50 hours a week on things that I have the capacity for. So mm -hmm. lots of reading, lots of writing, lots of research, lots of podcast editing, you know, things like that, that I feel really good about. I, I you know, for a long time, I had a hard limit on weekends. Like I do not work on weekends. You have got to be kidding me. And probably since the beginning of 2022, I've worked almost every weekend simply because the work I do just kind of slides into my life. It is, it is my life. But I think sort of like the idea that a creative constraint can help us come up with whether it's new artworks or innovation or, you know, a new marketing strategy. For me, my capacity is a creative constraint on my business model. Mm. And so I have to be able to say, okay, I can't do the things that I know make me easy money now, right? Like I could make a lot more money if I was still a business coach or if I was speaking on a regular basis or, you know, all of these different things. But that's not my capacity. So given that constraint, what can I do? And for now, kind of what I've landed on is, you know, I work with my husband on our podcast production agency to a degree. We have that support. And I, I essentially am the sort of business strategist, business coach for that business kind of in-house. So it's less of me hands-on time and more of like answering questions, you know, supporting him as he needs and supporting our team as they need. And then on the flip side of that, it's like teaching a workshop here and there, you know, as long as it's a kind of a contained time bound kind of thing. I'm good with that. I still very much enjoy teaching. So I, I do that. And then honestly, you know, having subscriptions to my newsletter and just allowing people to pay me directly for the work that they've always loved from me and that I've always loved doing and always have the capacity for. And, you know, just kind of finding a way to make that work and, you know, acknowledging to myself that for as much of an overachiever as I am, for as much as I'm really good at making money, that it's okay if I'm making a lot less than I used to, because this is the way that I can take care of myself. And no, that's not going to work for everyone. And yes, there's a lot of privilege wrapped up into that. But there's also sort of like, there's a little bit of like working class scrappiness in there too, <laughs> um, which I, I think we share. That's just like, you know what, sometimes life, and in this case, having a good, supportive, I can make it through the day kind of life is more important than that paycheck at the end of the week. Yeah. Tara, I so appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was wonderful.
That's it for today. Our show is produced and edited by Mary Dew. Our assistant producer and sound engineer is Nick Krinko. Many thanks to the LinkedIn Presents family and to all our guests for sharing their stories. If you love the show, tell your friends. I would love you to leave a review because they really matter in helping the show get found. You could also follow us or subscribe. If you have a question for me or you want to submit an idea for the show, find me on LinkedIn, where you can follow me, message me, I promise I'll write back, or subscribe to my newsletter for more from the anxious achiever world. Thanks for listening.